Okay, geographers, we're going to talk geomorphology today. And the previous stuff that we've been talking about has been geology, whether it's physical or historical. We spent time on plate tectonics. We're going to be talking about the somewhat related stuff, but at the same time shifting gear. So it'll play off of geologic forces, which we've already discussed, but get into something entirely different. And really looking at not just how landscapes form, but how they change. And so two things with that. When I say landscape, what I'm talking about is just, you know, any area out in nature, just something when you go out and you see uh, just a, a general place somewhere out in nature. Right? It could be looking at uh, some you know, valley somewhere, a mountain somewhere, all sorts of different things. So landscape is just kind of a generic term. Okay? Uh, and another thing with this, as I'm talking about uh, all of this stuff today and get into things in the next couple of lectures that I'm also going to deliver, one thing you'll notice is that with a lot of these subjects here from here on out, they're going to be some weird terms and names, like just looking at this little bullet point uh, uh, thing of what we'll be covering, or at least a good chunk of what we'll be covering, you can see that for the most part, a lot of these words are most likely new to you. Right? Denudation, fluvial, eolian, uh, literal, uh, glacial hopefully makes some sense to you, talking about glaciers. Uh, but the trick in going through this is to simply take the time to figure out which word means what. And that will help for, you know, your studying before you take the test. It will help you to take the test if you're faced with some question and it's asking about, let's say, Aeolian landforms. Uh, Aeolian means wind, okay? So wind produced. We'll get into how wind uh, causes erosion and deposition and creates these very distinct landforms, but it's all based on wind blowing around into an area. All right, so if you know it's about Aeolian landforms, then you know the answer has to have something to do with wind, and it can't be, you know, glacial stuff or literal, refers to coastal, like wave based stuff. Fluvial refers to rivers or flowing water. All right, so as long as you know these terms, you should be fine. Like, that will help you quite a bit. And in fact, this section of material, like the geology stuff, can be challenging. But the geomorphology stuff that I get into here, and both are going to be on your third exam, but the ge geomorphology stuff is typically easier for students to deal with, um, simply because you can just memorize some of these terms, remember some of the uh, Greek and Latin root stuff that I'll be getting into and we'll be reading about in the textbook and all of them. As long as you can keep track of that, you can do quite well in answering stuff. And you might also say, like, why? I know I did this when I was in college. Like, why do they need a special term for every? Why can't they just say what it is? And why do we have to have this term and have these subterms and all this stuff? It actually does make life easier once you go on to study the stuff, actually work with it. If you were to become a geomorphologist or work in this field, these terms would actually make life easier for you down the road. And of course, most of you guys in this class aren't going to go on to become geomorphologists, you know, because you have uh, you know, much better career goals, like, you know, to be office person um or what look I've, I've already i missed the good old days right when i mocked your uh, major choices in class i'm not going to do this now uh safe learning environment everybody's included um but yeah if you're to do something awesome like be a geomorphologist to go out into the field and study these different landforms it would be helpful for those of you who are just in this for the ge credits well tough deal with it get through it uh, and then you never have to think about these words ever again. All right? All right, so let's get moving here with good old geomorphology. And this, again, 
it's a case of let's you know look at these words think about what they mean so if we you know, my my greek uh speakers out there geo means what earth i hopefully you shouted i think i've quizzed you guys on that a handful of times already morph means what and i pause and i let you guys shout out like change um which is complete garbage. It actually means shape, right? We've turned morph into this verb. Um, those Power Rangers or whatever, that was where it first started. Um, but it really, it's referring to shape. And then ology is the study of, right? So it's the study of the shape of things on the earth. Okay? Or more simply, it's the science of landforms. And a landform is a generic term just referring to some object out in nature that has been classified, it has a name, and what we're going to be getting into is how these landforms come to be. All right, we technically, we've already talked about mountains a little bit, like when we got into plate tectonic stuff, a mountain is a landform because it's a thing that's out there in nature, and we can point to it, and we can say, hey, that's a mountain. All right, now this image here on the screen is a river delta. Specifically, it's the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, that's another landform. And that is a fluvial landform referring to uh, flowing water. All right, so fluvial, again, means anything that has been formed or altered or whatever, and I'll get into the differences between erosion and deposition. I'm talking about weathering today. We'll get into some of the, the details of that. But fluvial simply means some landform has been created in some way based on flowing water, right? Rivers, streams, creeks, you know, however you want to um, label these different flowing bodies of water. But the Mississippi River, because it's moving down through the United States, heading out toward the Gulf of Mexico. It's doing a lot of erosion, it's doing a lot of deposition, and at the very end, we have a delta that forms. And this is, if you've looked at a map of the U.S., this is the weird-looking part of Louisiana, where it, it just does the weird tentacles like going out into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that's the delta. And we're not going to spend time in the interest of time here. I'm not going to be dwelling on fluvial stuff. Uh, for this section, so we're not going to get into deltas specifically, but it's just it's a good example of one of these landforms. So we're going to be studying how these things come to be. How do they form? How do they change? And then in many cases, you know, why do we care? What's special about these things? Or why is it good to know how they form? All right, so we'll see some of the, the what's in it for me kind of stuff as well. All right, now this gorgeous right if you don't think so oh, get out of the desert um and we'll talk about deserts we'll get into how you know cool deserts can actually be in this section and with the last section when we get into biogeography i'll spend time just talking about how deadly uh deserts can be especially our mojave um but with this right here we're looking at uh like these are trees my little, my little desert geographers and that's water flowing through. That's the Rubicon River. And we have this granite out here. Now, last time I was getting into all this geology stuff, I talked about granite, spent time on it. Uh, what kind of rock is granite? Let's just have a little rookie session here. So if we're to classify granite, it would be what? First, is it sedimentary, metamorphic, or igneous? Hopefully you said igneous. Uh, and what kind of igneous? We have our two classifications. We have intrusive and extrusive. And this one is intrusive, right? Meaning that we have magma. So rock that is so hot, it turns into molten liquid rock. And it's called magma when that molten rock is underneath the surface. Right, and we have the inside of the Earth. It's hot because uh, um, you know the the radioactive decay, these isotopes that are are breaking down. We've 
you know, covered all this stuff, so it's really hot inside the earth, causes rock to melt. We have convection, which causes this stuff to rise toward the surface. That magma gets stuck, right? Slowly cools, and the very large grained, uh, light in color because it's felsic granite will form. Okay, and then eventually, over time, and a lot of this is plate tectonic related stuff, the movement of plates and folding and faulting as well as erosion and all of that, over a lengthy period of time, this uh, intrusive igneous rock, that granite that forms deep, you know, miles beneath the surface and cools uh, slowly over, you know, years, like it's a long, long process. Once that actually cools, it also eventually works its way up to the surface and it's exposed, right? Like we see right here, okay? So that's how the, these, uh, the, the rocks themselves came to be. But honestly, what really makes a scene like this, a landscape like this, attractive is it's, it's some of the other stuff that's going on, right? It's not just the geology. Like the granite can be beautiful, and we'll see. We're going to talk about Yosemite uh, in a bit, which is some you know, incredibly gorgeous examples of just granite and, you know, an immense amount of granite. So we'll we'll get into that. But it's it's not just the granite itself. It's how this granite breaks down and changes. And so we've got evidence of weathering here in a picture like that we're seeing right here. We're going to be talking about weathering today. We'll get into that. We've got the fluvial stuff happening, that river that's coming through. It's helping to, you know, break down and carry away some of this granite so it has a distinct shape and of course that also leads to you know the trees that we have here the plant life as well as the animal life and all that that helps make the the you know greater landscape so we're going to be getting into not just how do these things come to be but why do they look the way they do and why do we have if for nothing else why do we have some places that are just gorgeous and then other places that aren't right how do these things just get aesthetically pleasing that's a big part of what geomorphology is and so we'll be we'll be getting into that and to kind of keep along with this idea of geology and geomorphology we've got this general process at work okay so you can see this first word here right endogenic would be the like proper way to just kind of plow through it but endogenic is what it's saying Right, endo meaning inside, genic, think like genesis, creating. Um, so these are forces inside the earth that are creating stuff. They're coming from within and they're creating what we call initial landscape. So that's that granite that we saw. Physical geology, tectonic activity, stuff that's happening inside the earth. Um, and even if it comes up to the surface, if it starts inside the earth, that's going to be our initial landscape. And that's what we start with. But then exogenic or exogenic, right? Exo, exterior, things that are created outside of the earth. These exogenic forces are going to create what are called sequential landscapes, meaning we have these things that are created inside the earth and work their way up to the surface but then you have stuff outside of the earth atmospheric things as well as other stuff we'll get into that's what this geomorphology is that's carving and rearranging and manipulating these initial landscapes to turn them into something new all right and this whole process it's continuous that's a big part of plate tectonics is that we know it's a continuous thing. Early geomorphologists, pre, you know, knowledge of tectonic activity, they assumed that, you know, the Earth was trying to balance. You're trying to maintain this balance between the two, the internal and external forces, right? Uh, so that, you know, sounds good, um, but we know with plate tectonics that the Earth is actually what we'd consider to be dynamic meaning that it can change just all the time and continues to change. There's no such thing as balance or achieving harmony or whatever. You'll have, you know, the stuff from inside working its way up to the surface, 
Once it gets to the surface, it gets worn down, but then something new happens and stuff gets pushed back up and then it gets worn back down and so on. So the earth is not trying to achieve some balance here, even if it might feel that way, uh, but that's because it goes back to geologic time, right? That we humans were here for, you know, a century if we're lucky, whereas a lot of this stuff is happening over you know, thousands, if not millions, if not billions of years. So it might seem stable during our lifetimes, but given enough time, in the grand scheme of the planet, this stuff will be dramatic and continually changing. And one thing with this, too, these do work at different uh, speeds here, right? So all this stuff happening inside, all this tectonic activity, all that physical geology, that's happening over millions of years, right? That's a lengthy, slow period. And I think I mentioned this before, like with tectonic activity, this stuff is operating at the speed at which our fingernails grow, right? The idea that you can't look at your fingernails and actually see them grow, even though they're technically growing every single day, right? But it, you, have, you can't see it happening right there. You have to wait a period of time, kind of like what it looks like right now, and then come back in a month and look at them. And then you'll start to see some change, but it's a very slow process, right? Whereas this exogenic stuff, the stuff that's happening outside, the weathering, the erosion, the deposition, that can actually happen much more rapidly. It can happen over a period of decades. Uh, it can happen in human lifetimes. So we can more, much more easily see the changes at work, so much slower for the internal tectonic stuff, much faster for the external geomorphology stuff, and that too, I think, is why students have a, an easier time with some of this material, is it's not quite so abstract. We can actually see it taking place. We've either seen it ourselves, um, or, you know, we can see some maps, and go, like, I'll show some stuff today and continuing on. It just, it makes a little more sense because it's a little more obviously directly related to us. All right, so that's, that's our idea. Now, this map is something that I would test you on if everything was normal, but because we're doing all this online and we've had issues with Canvas loading up uh, the you know, images and like the hydrologic cycle, um, can't remember if I talk to you guys on these video lectures about that or not, uh, I'm not going to have this loaded up and expect you to answer questions about it just because I can't rely on it. But the reason why this map is important is uh, because geomorphology, there's, you know, a, a what is going on and there's a why that's going on. And we're going to cover that stuff. But one really important component is where is this stuff occurring, right? And, and we'll see examples of that, but we have very distinct different landforms over here on the West Coast than we would, you know, say in the, the East Coast or in the middle of the country or whatever. That has to do with different climate, uh, which is, you know, an exogenic force. So the weather that's occurring over lengthy periods of time, that will create specific landforms, as well as some of the tectonic stuff, that initial bedrock that's being worked on. So where is a really important thing? I'm going to point some of this stuff out, but I'm not going to make you memorize the physiographic divisions that exist. And this term, it's simply these are regions where the geography is more or less the same. So we have our Pacific Mountain System. We'll be talking, let me get my laser thing here. Um, the Pacific Mountain System, we'll be talking about stuff that happens in the Sierra quite a bit today and, and in a few you know, future uh, lectures. We'll talk about Yosemite, which exists within this system. Now we, like me right now, broadcasting this from the Mojave Desert, from the Antelope Valley, we're actually, we're in this little notch right here. So this V-shape thing there, that's the where the uh, southern Sierra Nevada 
Then we have the transverse ranges or San Gabriel, San Bernardino Mountains, uh, all of this stuff where it kind of comes together and meets. And the Antelope Valley is right here nestled in that little notch. All right, so if we look out to the mountains, that's this you know, division point right here. So we're technically in this intermontane plateau division. Uh, and we'll be talking about Death Valley. That's an example of something here, as well as we'll probably, we're going to talk a lot about desert stuff when I get into Aeolian processes. So we'll cover that. The Rockies, not going to talk about that so much. We'll see some interior plain stuff later on. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. I think today I'm talking about Karst, um, which is something in this Atlantic plain. We'll specifically be talking about Florida. There's the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, that I already talked about. So that's that's what I'm getting at. Like the where is a really important thing here. So good news, I'm not going to have a blank version of this map and you're going to be figuring out where this stuff is and talking about it. But still, to fully understand some of these landforms, it's good for you to have a sense of where these things are. All right, all right, let's, let's move on. So this term here, journey, saw, denudation, is a catch-all term to help describe everything we're going to be covering over the next handful of lectures, up until the next um, exam that we have. Okay? So denudation is any process, we're going to talk about a handful of these, that wears away or rearranges landforms. Okay? So wear away, meaning, you know, get rid of, removing material, making it smaller, Rearranging can be a case of some of that. So when you're, you know, making something smaller over here, that material it has to go somewhere. So it gets picked up, carried elsewhere, is deposited somewhere else. All of this, this whole process of change of a landform, can be classified as denudation. All right. Today specifically, we'll cover weathering. We'll talk about mass wasting uh, briefly um, in here. That's on today's agenda. Next time, I don't even know what this is. I think I'm going to talk about Aeolian stuff. Next time, we'll also talk glaciers. Um, but we'll get into specifically how glaciers, as well as wind, and we'll, also, we'll talk a little fluvial stuff too, uh, how those processes can erode landforms, take stuff away. And then again, as I said, anything that gets taken away has to be deposited elsewhere. So we'll get into like specific types of Aeolian deposition or glacial deposition or whatever. All right, so that's that's what denudation means. All right, here's an example. Now, first, pop quiz, what kind of rock is this? Did you answer? I, I can't hear you. Um, marble. Hopefully you said, oh, it's clearly marble. And what is marble? Right, right, it's a metamorphic rock. Perfect. Uh, but what... Um, what did it start out as? Limestone. Yeah, class. Fantastic. Look, here's the point. I don't really care about that per se right now. They'll, they'll keep working on it because it'll be on your next test. Um, but what we care about now, at this very moment, is not how this, this marble came to be, but what caused it to explode, to shatter, to break apart in this way. All right? Because it looks like. You know, somebody came along with a hammer, or lifted this whole thing up and dropped it, and it shattered here. But we'll find it's actually ice is what caused this. So we'll get into that. We'll get into the inner workings of this physical weathering. I'll get into exactly what physical weathering is, but we'll get into how stuff like this comes to be. And you might think, why? Right? Who cares? But we'll get into how this can be. It's it's sexier than just broken rocks. Like it, it involves you know death um of tourists uh, and stuff like that. So well yeah ooh yeah we'll cover that. Uh, pop quiz. What is this? What are we looking at right here? It's granite. Um. So this is uh, uh, uh one of the many gorgeous landscapes that we have uh, out in Joshua Tree. National Park, which if you haven't been, I'm going to be talking about a lot about national parks. Some good stuff, some bad stuff. Uh, so we'll cover that. If you haven't been out to Joshua Tree, uh, good. You know what? Stay away. Because I 
love it. Uh, and my kids love it. And you can see why kids love it, because it's just rocks everywhere. Where would we just go camping, and the kids just wander off and, and you know, haven't lost one yet, uh, falling uh, off a cliff or anything. Uh, so it's fantastic. So if you haven't been, you know, don't. Uh, so I can keep getting camping spaces. Um, but I guess if I'm not going to go there, like, go ahead and go. It's gorgeous. I lo- like, And you might say, it's called Joshua Tree. We got those trees around here. We live in the Mojave Desert. This is a pretty special part of the Mojave Desert. But, um, you know, one of these, these special things could be just the presence of granite, which we have around. But also looking at this, we've got things like jointing in here. We'll be talking about what that is. We have spheroidal weathering at work, which is the result of this chemical weathering. So we'll you know, get into uh, uh, that. So hopefully, if you really are studying this stuff and paying attention to it, when you look at something like this, you don't simply say, eh, a bunch of rocks or whatever. Hopefully you can look at this and start to see, oh, okay, this is how this came to be. And then this happened and then that happened. And you can tell a story about that landscape that you're looking at. All right, so we'll, we'll get into all the, the details there. What kind of volcano is this? You probably don't know because we didn't talk about it. Uh, although hopefully you, you know, you read the chapter on volcanoes and you answer the questions. And so in doing so, you're looking at that and you're like, that's, that looks like a shield volcano to me. And if you said that, I would say, absolutely. Um, but, you know, that's, I mean, that's one thing to discuss. We know how the basalt gets here and these effusive eruptions and all that. But the, the thing from the, you know, the geomorphology of it, the denudation and all that, are these sharp ridges that we have running down. So ridge, that term, we'll use it a handful of times over the next few lectures, just refers to these, you know, continuous, you know, high up, high relief areas along here, radiating down from the peak. Okay, so the, a peak would be that high point of a mountain. We call it a summit or a zenith. I mean, there are other words you can use here for this stuff. But peak means that top point. And then we have these ridges radiating down from it, and they're incredibly sharp, and that's a result of erosion. Anytime we have canyons, ravines, which effectively mean the same thing. There are a lot of nuanced labels, names for, for different things out here. But just, you know, the low points in here, the little valley things that are coming out from the peak, those are uh, erosional landforms, meaning that, you know, all of this was one continuous slab of basalt, but through erosion, the stuff that's lower got removed, right? There was material was taken out to leave these little valleys, these canyons, that kind of stuff behind. And that can be deposited quite often down at the base of the mountain. We're not going to spend any time on literal processes and, you know, the coastal stuff, but, you know, a lot of the erosion that's up here, as well as stuff on these headlands, will result in the sand that we have left, uh, um, you know, left over after that denudation process, right? So you have stuff getting worn away, stuff getting deposited. We also have oxidation, which is rusting. That's a type of uh, chemical weathering right there. So everything on here. I mean, you you know, before this class, you look at something like that and go, like, oh, it's pretty, or whatever. After this class, the goal will be like, oh, it's pretty. And, and, and here's how it came to be, right? Or what? It, I don't know. Impress your friends. Whatever. All right. So that's that. Um, now, to... To get moving with some of this stuff, let's get into a few more terms. So I already mentioned weathering earlier, but precisely what we're talking about here is the physical breakdown or the chemical alteration of rocks. Right? And so it's the idea we're going to get into. There are two different types and a broad classifications. We've got physical weathering and then chemical weathering. And both can happen. You know, on uh, uh, the the same rock, uh, they're just different processes, and so I want you guys to be able to know the difference. Generally speaking, about physical weathering, chemical weathering, but also the the exact types that I introduce. Okay? but this this actual physical breakdown that we're dealing with, um, it's where a bigger rock just gets broken into smaller bits of rock. 
biochemical weathering is where that bigger rock dissolves or decays or there's some kind of transformation. So it's not just it starts out big and it gets into smaller pieces. Uh, it's it actually disappears because of some chemical process at work. And again, we'll get into the precise details. And then this term differential weathering refers to stuff like this. Like this is not too far from us. If you head up north on the 14, we have Red Rock State Park, uh, not to be confused with like the 10 other Red Rock um, different parks, monuments, stuff like that throughout the southwest. And that red refers to the oxidation at work. We'll briefly like I said, talk about that. Um, but with this spot, like what makes it attractive is that it's not just weathering going on, but this differential weather, where we have different rates at which the material weathers and therefore different rates at which it erodes. And so we have stuff that's sticking out and stuff that's cut in. We have the cool columns that are here. We have these layers, the strata that are sticking out. The tilting, of course, is tectonic stuff, which we already covered. But this resulting, just jagged, interesting looking landscape, that's differential weathering at work. Okay, so we'll learn about the processes themselves, but when we're really studying a specific landform, what's also interesting are the different rates at which the stuff is taking place. Okay, here's a classic example here, Arches National Park uh, out in Utah. This And this is classic in the sense of, you know, if you've ever watched a Looney Tune uh, cartoon, You've seen something like this, right? With the Roadrunner and the Coyote being chased around. Uh, it's fascinating to look at and fascinating when you just, you know, see these balancing rocks on top of, you know, smaller ones. And the idea is, if we go back to that initial landscape, the ground was up here, right? This was all connected. This was where you would be walking. But over time, through weathering and then erosion and other, you know, deposition, just all this denudation that's taken place, it's resulted in this landscape. And so we have clearly some rocks that have resisted weathering and therefore resisted erosion and others that have it. And the really cool thing is that you've got a lot of, you know, erosion at work in here. So it just gets skinnier and skinnier. All this talus down at the bottom which is just stuff that has weathered and fallen down and piled up uh, along the bottom. And it's the idea that it will just continue to weather and material will be eroded and so on. And it will continue to change over time. But for now, we just we get this really cool looking landscape. All right, so that's the, the idea here. Now, as I said, weathering is going to be physical or it's going to be chemical. And we can put, you know, we can have an and or. You can have sometimes some physical stuff happening, and then chemical stuff comes in and so on. The key thing is we're talking about this stuff is that weathering is not moving the rock material. It's simply breaking it apart. Yeah, it's this process through which a bigger solid hunk of rock starts to get broken down, either physically or chemically, and so that it gets smaller or stuff starts to dissolve, or, or whatever. All right? So erosion is the actual movement of material. We'll be talking about that later. Today we're simply getting into how do big hunks of rock start to break apart? How does this whole denudation process begin? And we'll also see, well, weathering isn't actually moving it. Gravity will come in and start to actually cause this stuff to fall down. So we'll see examples of weathered material moving. It's not really erosion. It, it gets into mass wasting. I'll get into what that is later as well. And what we're dealing with too, just for some more terminology to make it clear, what we've got in this image here, bedrock, that's the initial landscape, right? That's all the physical geology, tectonic stuff we've covered already. Regolith uh, this is talking about broken down or weathered bits of bedrock. So we're getting into, we're spending time uh, in here getting into how this bigger, more connected bedrock gets into smaller pieces. And again, I realized, like, I fell asleep talking about that myself. It's not the sexiest topic. 
like you'll see there's some good stuff that comes with this. So this this image looks kind of Dullsville, um, but it is it's important to get what's going on here. And then later, we're not going to talk about soil. That was an editorial decision on my part. Usually I'll spend a, a whole, you know, lecture on talking about uh, dirt, um, but I'm not going to in the interest of time, although it's fascinating. Um, but that's, you know, soil, it's a complex thing. There's an organic component to it uh, as well. Living things, you know, working through here and chemical reactions based on that stuff and processes and all that. But it's also, it's regolith that continues to break down. Uh, so, which is connected to bedrock and to cells. Everything in the ground is connected, but we study it at these different stages, if you want to think of it that way. All right, now one thing, in fact, if we go back here, you can see the cracks, like bedrock, even if it was all formed at the same time, um, it's not just one consistent, homogenous hunk of rock. You'll have little breaks in it. And what we're talking about now are what we call joints or jointing in rocks. So it's where we have breaks in the rock that aren't faults. It's not based on tectonic movement and these stresses on the rock. Uh, it's really what it is. It's, it's how the, the molecules inside the rock, how everything aligns in there. It's going to break along these natural planes right, throughout, meaning just, you know, the slightest bit of stress or whatever it'll snap it'll break it'll fracture along these these lines in here and if it's not the result of you know plates being pulled apart or compressed together if it's not this hardcore tectonic stuff they're just cracks in the rock we refer to them as joints or jointing and what this means is that there's now this this uh, opening into the rock it's now vulnerable to weathering outside stuff this exogenic stuff, right? Exogenic, things that form outside of the earth. They can now get into the rock, and that sets the stage for weather, whether it's physical or chemical. Now, physical, as I, I think I already mentioned, but just to make sure we're clear, it's where we have a physical force acting on the rock, where it's actually breaking the rock into smaller pieces. So we start with this big rock, Physical weathering happens, and it breaks it into smaller hunks of the same rock. So there's no chemical reaction, no chemical change at all. It's just physical force. The equivalent of, you know, if you were to take a sledgehammer and hit it on a rock and break it into a few pieces, that's, you know, artificial physical weathering. What we're getting into is how that happens naturally. In the absence of humans coming in and breaking stuff, nature is doing that as well. And we're going to cover these four types of physical weather. Okay, vegetation, which is pretty straightforward. We'll get into how plants can do some physical weathering. And we'll talk about salt weathering. We'll get into three and four frost action and this exfoliation stuff. That's specific to uh, granite like we see in the Sierra Nevada. Okay, whereas salt weathering is specific to desert environment. So we'll see again, it's not just what's happening, but where is it taking place. So vegetation. This is all we need to say. Oh, it's a, a tree growing through a damn rock, right? That's what's going on. And what happened was we had some kind of jointing in this granite outcrop right here. There was a crack in the rock that allowed soil to, you know, develop in here, a seed to get in here, a plant to start to grow, and everything just worked out. And so over decades, this tree just continued to grow and get bigger and bigger and continued to exert physical force on the rock itself until it split it in two. And clearly, I mean, you can just see the shape of the tree and all this. It's not like this, this um, you know, granted here was two separate boulders uh, at work, and then the tree just grew in the middle. No, the tree is clearly breaking these things apart, right? So that's just a very simple explanation or example of physical weather. And like I said, it's only need to talk about tree, damn rock. All right, number two, salt weathering. This is pretty cool stuff, and it happens in dry, arid, or desert environments. Uh, we'll get into you know why that is. We'll see 
why that is, but it's, it's in an area where you don't have a lot of rain falling consistently throughout the year, okay? as well as you need to have uh, the right geologic processes and different types of rock, like we see here, shale and sandstone in this example, right? So you need all this stuff to work together. But in a desert where we don't have a lot of uh, rain coming in, we still do get rain, but what happens is you'll have a lot of rain falling, but you don't have the other processes that take place um, in a more humid environment where you get more rain throughout the year. And so one example, is the presence of salts in desert soils, okay, as well as in the rocks and all of that. Um, and so salts, pluralize it, because it's salt, if you want to think of it that way, um, but there's also, you know, gypsum is another example. Things that are salt-like, little white, um, you know, bits of, of mineral exist out here. And in other places where you'd get more rain coming in, uh, the rain would pick up this stuff, the salts would get dissolved into the water, they'd be carried out to the you know, stream that's going to carry it out even further, and that stuff would get dumped out in the ocean, carried away. Right? In a desert, you don't have enough water for these streams to develop. You don't have permanent year-round streams running in an area. You don't have a good way to get rid of the salt, so the rain falls down, it dissolves the salts, but the rain kind of all hangs out in the general desert area. Temperatures heat up, the water evaporates, that rainwater goes away, but the salts are left behind. And so the result is we get these salts concentrated in an area, and therefore desert soils are a lot saltier, more alkaline as well. We'll talk about some of that stuff in the biogeography section when it becomes really relevant. Um, but it's the idea that that uh, this stuff just concentrates. And so you get saltier, saltier soils in the desert, which you wouldn't get in places of more rainfall. All right, so what happens is that as rain falls down, let's go up here, so the rain is falling down, that water's mixing with the existing salts, it dissolves that stuff, and then the water can move through sandstone. So it's permeable, meaning that water can flow through it, and it's just because of the way in which sandstone lithifies. Whereas the shale down here, it's more compact and it gets back into the idea of different, you know, sizes of clastic materials forming together. You've got sand making this, um, clay making the shale there. So the water can flow through here and it brings with it those salts and then goes through and gets stuck, kind of piles up um, down here, can't keep moving through the shale, kind of work towards some exit but eventually and as you know the rain stops and temperatures heat up and all of that that water is going to evaporate and the crystals these salt crystals are going to be left behind okay and when they are left behind this gets remember we talked about things dissolving and chemical precipitate sedimentary rocks how limestone forms and all that it's the idea that the stuff is the salts are invisible um, when they're dissolved in the water when that water leaves, the salts recrystallize. Right? They, they actually take shape. Right? They become something. And I mentioned the idea of before, when we talked about evaporites and we were talking about all that physical geology stuff. Um, you, know, you take a bowl of water. You know, it's heating up uh, around the AV. Real easy to do this. Take a little bowl of water, um, put some salt in there, stir it around to dissolve it, leave it by the window. Come back in a few hours, that water is going to be gone the salt has crystallized, right? It's, it's taken form. You have those little salt crystals there. And those salt crystals are going to take up space. And so what they can do is chip away at the, uh, you know, what they'll do is really chip away at this sandstone right here and dig in and make all sorts of holes and caves and stuff like that, all right? Now this image, again, I get it. I hear you. I felt the same way when I was learning about some of this stuff. Like, how is this, you know, how, ooh, a little groove in, in the rock, right? That's not, it's not sexy. That's not exciting stuff. Until you realize, like, just how much salt we can be talking about. Now this, and I'm kind of jumping, you know, from place to place here with the next few pictures, but it's to prove a point. But right here, 
we're looking at Death Valley National Park, which is another fantastic one to go to. And you'll see, when we talk about Yosemite, which I have a love-hate relationship with, um, Death Valley, I love it. If for no other reason, then they tell I mean, it's got death in its name, right? They let you know what you're dealing with, um, you know, when you just you even read about it for the first time, right? Death. And, and yeah, it's a very inhospitable, terrifying place. And one reason for that is not just the lack of water, um, but just the presence of salt. Like this area right here, this is the bad water uh, basin. It's what it's called, bad water, because, yeah, it's the low point. It'll fill up with water after a few of the, you know, the few brief rainstorms that happen in Death Valley. This will collect water, but it's so salty, you know, way, way saltier and nastier than the ocean, e even. You can't drink the water, right? Hence the name. So what we're looking at here, well, the white, these are the salt. And just if you're wondering, like if you scoop down and pick some of it up and you taste it, it's not quite, you know, it's not salty. Like going to the ocean because of the gypsum. So maybe I didn't dig down enough. I don't know. But still, it's clearly it's clearly the, the salts that are out here. And if you look, you can see out in the distance, I mean, it just goes on forever. And the brown on either side, that's just dirty salt. That's just areas that haven't been trampled on by tourists walking through here. So this is, we're talking about a lot, a lot of this material out here. When you realize that, just how much we have in terms of salts in these desert arid environments, you can start to see what salt weathering can actually do. Okay, And so we have these cliff faces throughout the American Southwest, like this is Canyon Duche uh, in Arizona, where it's massive. And these, these massive caves in the cliffs are simply the result of salt crystals forming and chipping stuff away. Right? And this is where we've had the, we learn about, you know, what, third or fourth grade here in California, about the Pueblo Indians, the cliff dwellers, learn about these structures. It's crazy about this when I was never taught in elementary school. Um, but the actual, the caves in which these structures were built, this is that salt weathering in action. So these, you know, multi-storied structures and all the stuff where it's built in here, it's the result of salt cutting away. This is Mesa Verde in, in Colorado, same kind of deal. So when you realize that all of this is the result of salt crystals, you start to get a sense of how massive this operation can be, again, in the right environment. So in the American Southwest, very dry areas where we've got enough sandstone and shale and the salts can get in here and accumulate and all that, we start to see some of these massive caves on the side of cliffs. All right, so that's number two. Number three, it's what we call frost action, or sometimes called frost wedging, or freeze thaw action, or you get, you'll see different terms if you Google this stuff. Um, but frost action, you know, hence the name, it has to do with ice, okay? Freezing of some kind. And so this granite boulder right here that was split in two, it was split in two because of ice, because of water getting in, freezing, expanding, and then pushing this out, right? And it's the idea that water, as it freezes, um, well, actually, as it cools, it, it gets smaller, it contracts. Like, we learn about that, um, you know, in our early science classes, that, you know, cool contracts, hot stuff expands. Uh, and so that works for water up until the point where it actually freezes. And it has to do with how the H2O molecules actually align in the shape they take and so it causes really cold water once it freezes to actually take up more space this is the issue if you've had you know your pipes break in your home or you put a you know a soda or beer or whatever in the freezer and and forget about it um and it explodes uh you know that's what's happening in our daily lives that's also what's happening to rock so out in nature in a place like the sierra nevada you have water falling down, right? You have rain uh, and you have water flowing and everything's cool and then it gets really cold at night and this stuff will freeze. And what happens is it gets into the rock. Water, you know, goes into some joint, some opening in there, right? The water goes in. As it freezes, it expands and it's like a wedge in that it goes in and it, it widens that hole in the rock or that crack in the rock. So it's expanding. 
the crack there. And now that that crack has gotten bigger, means the next time water comes down in it, uh, there can be more water, which will then expand and it will open up and it will just continue to get bigger until the whole thing splits into two or more pieces. All right, so that's what frost action is doing. And we can see it in areas where it, it's what is uh, referred to as joint block separation, where it, you've got stuff where it almost looks industrial in the sense that water is coming down and uh, you know getting into the stuff and splitting it into these blocks and it's kind of geometric in shape kind of you know remarkable in how um, geometric it can be and again i get it um you're looking at it like wow small lungs are up Ooh. but no this is this is good stuff and this is important for uh california because we have a lot of granite and we have a lot of granite that's stuck up pretty high you know up in the air I had a great example of this, but not the only one. But a great example is Yosemite National Park, which I'll be talking about. Talk about it today. Talk about glaciers. I'll, I'll get into that because that's a big uh, part of how the park came to be. Uh, and so with the park, it's it's the Yosemite Valley is what we typically refer to. And that's this low point down here. And then on either side of the valley, we have these just huge uh, granite cliff faces. Right? We've got uh, Half Dome back here is a famous one. And then El Capitan is uh, the other famous one. Um, and there are all sorts of, like, you can watch they're all of this free solo. Uh, and uh, what is it? The Dawn Wall are two fantastic climbing uh, documentaries about crazy individuals who climb this stuff. Um, and are just, you know, unbelievable and, and how they're able to do it. But you can really get a sense of the enormity of this stuff when you see these documentaries and see what these insane individuals are doing. And of course, the reason why Yosemite is such a big spot for rock climbers is because we just have these massive sheer granite cliffs right there. But it's not just for, you know, climber dudes to come and hang out and, and climb on this stuff. I mean, people come from all over the world to see it. You've got the beautiful waterfalls. We'll get into why this is uh, here and, and why everything uh, exists in the way it does. Um, but, you know, for now, I want to get into the weather at work here. What's going on with this park? And I should also say, too, like that, I mean, usually I'd have you guys write about this stuff. Um, I don't think I'm going to have you do that do any of that stuff on the, the test. In fact, yeah, I already decided I'm not going to have you write uh, an essay component on the exam, so don't worry about it. Um, but I usually have you write about Yosemite and explain how it came to be. Now, that said, there'll still be some questions about how Yosemite came to be, like multiple choice stuff and all that, so don't tune out. Um, but Yosemite, it's just a really important park for California and for the United States. I personally... I hate it. Uh, if I never go back, I'll be okay with that. Uh, although I feel like I have to go to show my kids because they haven't seen it. Like I, I, the last time I went was, I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe. And that was fine. Um, if we're, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's pretty. You guys been? It's pretty. Um, it's too many people. You know, that's, that's one issue. So many people have gone in into this place. Uh, and that's led to problems, as we'll see, uh, in terms of safety and all that. Also, just, I mean, it's important to state, as we're talking about national parks in this country, while they're beautiful, and they're ones I love to go to, and, and some I haven't seen yet, but I want to go see, and it's just breathtaking, wonderful stuff. It's also important we uh, Americans realize yeah, there were some people who lived here um, before we decided to make it a park, right? It turns out, yeah, are you guys aware of this? It turns out, before white folks got here, um, yeah, there were these, uh, they were called Indians, uh, apparently, and they lived all over the country, and, and they were, like, doing fine for millennia, but we showed up and made them all sick. Um, yeah, and we tend, we get that, right? Like, oh, my goodness, my daughter, because um, we were doing, of course, like, you know, before I start recording this stuff and getting it ready. The reason why this stuff isn't, you know, just showing up on a regular basis 
because I'm teaching, uh, you know, my kids, uh, while my wife is off, you know, doing her real job as a nurse at the hospital. Okay, she's a hero, whatever. What about me, right? I got to teach elementary school kids. Yeah, I'm, I'm the real first responder. So anyway, so I'm teaching my daughter you know, going through what she has to do, and we're talking about stuff, and she had a, uh, uh, finally, she's in fifth grade, finally had a lesson on the Trail of Tears, which do some Googling, um, if you, uh, aren't familiar with what Trail of Tears refers to, uh, and, and so she's reading it, and it's just, oh my god, oh, we, what? And she was just disgusted, and rightly so. We had a good talk um, about this stuff. So we kind of, we learn, we know that that you know the U.S. government wasn't the best toward Indians. Still, we have plenty of issues with that. But the national park system is one that's kind of we haven't really given it the scrutiny that we need to. The the idea that we had, and like especially with Yosemite. Oh my God! So there are Indians here, right? They're, they're uh, you know, already living here. The Yosemite Band that's actually in the valley itself. We have others, um, you know, Miwok uh, or Maidu. Uh, no, it's Miwok here uh, around the general area. Um, so we've got, you know, people here. But when Yosemite really starts to get explored by white folks, it's long past the Indian genocide that we uh, Americans embarked on in, in the 19th century, right? The real extermination of Indians and removal of Indians from the American West, right? So that's done. And a lot of Americans, you know, for better or worse, like there's still racial injustice and all sorts of stuff. And we're talking early, you know, 20th century, well before the Civil Rights Act and all that. But still, for the most part, a lot of Americans are are not too comfortable with overt genocide and overt removal of people, which is, you know, a good thing. So by the time you get people like John Muir and, and everybody exploring Yosemite and turning it into this, you know, destination, um, it's not okay to physically remove Indians from land at this point. So you got to get clever and creative. And actually what wound up happening, long story short, is that the Indians who were here, when this thing became a park, they were allowed to stay there, but the moment they actually left the valley, they could never come back in, right? So if they had a family member, you know, just over the hill who got sick or, you know, had some, you know, just wanted to travel, um, you know, more than five miles, uh, if they did that, they could never come back into Yosemite, could never rightfully live there or anything like that. Right. So that was I mean, it was a lot of this kind of stuff to ensure that, uh, you know, kind of really just couldn't kill the Indians, couldn't forcefully remove them. Um, but we can make life hell for them and hopefully they'll just go away. Right. That's it's like the little brother uh, mentality here to just make life difficult until you go crazy. All right. So there's that. Uh, and there was a little Indian village where Indians could live. And there was crazy stuff like they had contests. For the prettiest Indian babies, um, where like white folks would come in and like judge the aesthetic quality of a little Indian baby. I mean, that's crazy. Um, there also the Park Service decided that the Indians who live there were garbage Indians. That's poor California Indians have gotten this quite a bit. They weren't as cool as the other Indians, like the Plains or whatever. So they imported uh, feather headdresses and stuff from other Indians. To make the Indians here look more Indian-like, right? Even though it was, it had nothing to do with it. It would be like if, you know, if you thought like, man, he, yeah, he kind of looks like a white guy. Yeah, but he's not, he's not white enough, right? So you put me in like a leprechaun outfit or, or whatever. Um, you know, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense to do that. Nor does it make sense to take, you know, this Indian thing from this totally separate group and put it on this other group. Yeah, it was a whole mess. I mean, it was it was cruel. It was humiliating. That Indian village isn't there anymore. Uh, it long since burned down. Total accident, uh, I'm sure. And there are no Indians actually living here. And it's been, you know, a good hundred years plus since all that stuff has really been uh, an issue. So, you know, we forget about it. And we go here to take pictures of rocks. Um, 
Yeah, never forget. Uh, that this and this is really Death Valley and Josh, like all these different parks, even the ones I like. Um, they're not immune from this. There is a lot of removal, either prior to it becoming a park, or you know, once it became a park, people whose traditional lands were in this park, they can't do the same stuff they used to be able to do because it was made a park. Right, so that's one issue right there. The park system sucks, uh, even though it is good to preserve our natural lands. Right, so it's a complex thing. So there's that. But as I said, too, there are way too many people. Like running through here, there's all sorts of paved roads and trails and paths. A lot of people coming in. The last time I was there, I just couldn't hang um, at all with like the animals. Doesn't make sense. At all. I saw a gray fox. Never seen one of those in the wild. The only time I saw it, you know, technically in the wild was at Yosemite when it crossed the, the little path in front of me. So it wasn't even really wild. I swear to God, it like looked up at me. It seemed to smile at me. I don't think it spoke, but it kind of like thinking back, it kind of feels like it was like, hello, Mark, or something like it. Like it just, it was too human like. There was a mama deer and her little baby deer. And they were just hanging out next. Like, this is like Disney kind of nonsense that shouldn't exist in the wild, right? We shouldn't have animals quite this tame, quite this, uh, you know, uh, unafraid of, of potential predators and all that. But that's what's going on in Yosemite. It's, it's been made quite tame. And, and you might say, well, that sounds great. I want to play with a baby deer or whatever. But here's the problem. We try to pacify it and make it this very touristy fun place. But we also have stuff like this happening. And we call this a rock fall. And this refers to a bunch of rock falling. Huh? Not just a clever name. Uh, and this is the result. I mean, there are a few things that can trigger it. But a big component of this is that frost action. So we have water getting in to the joints on these different cliff faces in a place like Yosemite. The water gets in. Temperatures drop freezes, it expands, it chips away, until eventually we have a huge amount of this stuff just give way. Can't stay up anymore. It all collapses and we have a rock fall take place. And you can see, and these two are from the 90s, it happens somewhat regularly. The latest scary deadly one was uh, in 2017. I want to say maybe 2018, a few years ago, with the last actual fatal one. This was a fatal one uh, as well in that, you know, at least one person visiting the park died. And you can see, so this fell this whole way, but down here, you see some structures. And this is Curry Village, which is this, like, it's like the Walmart shopping mall area. I mean, there's a store. There's, like, just too much stuff uh, right here. But we try to have it in the wilderness, but the wilderness isn't tan. Like, it's the wilderness still, right? So this rock fell. A lot of it landed right here, and then just it didn't stop moving instantly. Other stuff, because of the energy involved, you know, hit here, went flying down there. It can be quite terrifying. All right, so it's this deadly, awful thing, but it's happening because, you know, geomorphology is happening. Just, you know, nature is changing. The Yosemite Valley is changing. This is fine if it happens miles away from where the tourists are all congregating. But quite often, it, it doesn't. And I have, I'm not going to play it because that's weird. But I have a video, I link to a YouTube video. Um, here you guys can find the slides on Canvas and click through this to see it. Or just Google, you know, uh, Yosemite Rockfall, El Capitan. Because it was on El Cap where it actually fell. And I mean, it's just amazing to see. The, just the clouds. And you might think it's, you know, it kind of looks like smoke. But it's really, it's just, it's dust, right? It's just granite. It's little bits of the rock that are tiny and up in the air, right? Pretty powerful stuff. So you can watch that video if you'd like, you know, whenever. Go back and see that. But a rock fall is one type of what we call mass wasting, right? Which is where we have a bunch of this weathered material head downhill quite quickly. Well, it doesn't have to. You can have some slow ones. Um, but in this case, like with a rock fall, just, you know, a bunch of this weathered stuff drops down. It's always because of gravity. It's always falling down because gravity is pulling it down. So rock falls are an example, landslides, and we're not going to get into all of the 
nuance behind this stuff. Uh, lahars, that's a volcanic mud flow kind of thing. Uh, but it's simply, it's the result of gravity causing a bunch of the stuff to head downhill. All right? And this term, this will become useful later on. But one thing that limits mass wasting is what we call the angle of repose. All right? And so this is like an engineering term, really, where we're talking about this maximum angle at which any slope, any and when we say slope, we mean like hill slide, right? The maximum angle at which it's going to remain stable, where you don't have to worry about mass wasting. We'll be talking about it with sand and, and sand dunes and how they form and move and change and all of that. Um, but you can see, and you don't need to memorize these numbers here, but with like a sand dune, where we're going to have more coarse sand. Uh, sand dunes roughly have an angle of repose between 30 to 35 degrees, meaning that if the angle from the ground up, you know, toward the peak on that slope, as long as it's less than 35 degrees, everything's going to be cool, right? But if it exceeds that, if it gets steeper, then it's prone for mass wasting. And if we go back to this, I mean, you can see these almost vertical cliff faces. They're not very stable to begin with, right? So this is why these rock falls can happen, why they're a concern, because it is so steep, because it's clearly well past the angle of repose, meaning that that stable angle for this uh, specific slope. All right, so we'll come back to angle of repose later, but just keep, you know, file that away in your notes right now. And so that's that's the whole frost action thing and mass wasting. And that's a you know, brief introduction to how this stuff can be significant in a place like Yosemite. Now, another thing with Yosemite that's also another type of physical weathering is this pressure release jointing followed by exfoliation. Okay? So it's two things that, that work together. Now, jointing goes back to cracks in a rock that aren't the result of this fault style movement, right? And this is specific here to granite. We see this in the granite um, that, that makes up the Sierra Nevada. And as I said just you know, moments ago, granite forms inside the earth. So we have cooling magma uh, slowly cooling in these cracks under the earth and other existing rocks. Um, as that it's cooling and forming. There's a lot of pressure involved because it's underneath the ground. You've got all this, you know, miles of rock on top of it, squeezing the stuff together. So granite forms under a lot of pressure. But once it moves up to the surface, there, nothing's holding it together, right? That pressure is gone. So once it's finally exposed through, you know, the movement that the erosion and tectonic movement and faulting and stuff like that that gets it up to the surface. Once there's nothing holding on to that granite, you can think of it like as it's forming, it's getting a nice big hug from the rest of the earth, right? Once it's no longer getting that nice big hug, it explodes. It actually explodes outwards. And that's what this pressure release jointing is referring to. It's the idea. So the outward explosion, it causes the rock to actually get bigger, right? It expands outward and it breaks or it has that jointing take place as a result. Okay? So we get these very distinct layers of, of cracks in the rock and we'll see examples of it. But one result of this is not just this layered rock, but it leads to what's called exfoliation and that will produce quite often an exfoliation dome. So up here, we see these rounded dome-like peaks, right? That rounded thing, that's the result of this pressure release jointing, producing these cracks in the rock. And this exfoliation process is where these little bits of, of uh, layer, layer of granite, just kind of break off, slough off, fall down to the uh, valley floor below or whatever it is. Uh, and it makes this dome shape. And I'm not entirely sure why it's a dome and has something to do with, you know, just the physics of how the stuff is forming and breaking and all of that. But the result is we get these exfoliation domes. All right, so you can see here a few things going on. We've got the rounded nature, but we've also got these little plates 
right, or flakes of granite, that's from that pressure release jointing. All right, so this is a picture of Yosemite from like 1913. I got a handful of these images. Here's another one uh, of Half Dome, which I pointed out earlier. And so Half Dome, the dome part, is a result of this jointing and exfoliation, so a rounded area. As we'll learn later on, the half part here, the sheer cliff, that's a result of a glacier moving through the valley a long time ago, breaking off that half of the dome and carrying it away, and also scooping out a lot of the valley floor itself and giving it this incredible look that it has. All right, so we'll, we'll get into that part later. But the rounded nature of Half Dome, as well as other peaks, you know, near the valley uh, and just throughout the Sierra, you can, you know, see it. You go up north, um, you can see a lot of this stuff in the northern Sierra Nevada, just kind of, you know, looking around. The rounded peaks, it's that exfoliation at work. Uh, here's a great image. I mean, look at this guy being awesome, and, and he was probably just, you know, judging Indian babies and being a real dick uh, earlier. I don't really care about the guy. Probably awful. Um, but I take this picture because you can see the lines running this way, right? That's that jointing that we're talking about. And so as this stuff breaks off, like we see there, again, that's that exfoliation process that can lead to these exfoliation domes. And then here he is again. Oh, he's exhausted from, uh, you know, picking on Indians. So he's taking a little sit um, under the world's saddest tree. But even that, like this tree, it's growing on granite. Like that is amazing. It's not very impressive, but it actually, when you look at it, it is remarkable in the sense that it's growing in one of these joints, right, where soil could develop and it gets just enough nutrients to exist. Maybe not, you know, as, as lush as it could possibly be somewhere else, but still it's growing, right? And you can see here, where this stuff is sloughing off, just gravity pulling this down. You can see where it buckles right there. So you can get a sense of how these things are just weathering simply because of how they were made, right? Because of all this pressure to start with. Now, once they get up to the surface, the pressure uh, is gone. They explode outward. And then just for the rest of, you know, eternity, as long as these mountains exist, they're going to continue to, you know, break off in this way, have this self weather. Uh, because of the, the explosion, and then gravity just kind of pull it away, or other erosion factors come in, or it allows for this uh, frost action to then take place, right? Or even, you know, some of the chemical stuff that we'll, we'll see in a bit. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Just go through here, make sure you know exactly what's going on. Like the vegetation stuff, not that big a deal, but make sure you understand the difference between salt weathering versus a frost action, versus this pressure release jointing, and so on, right? And then also remember that all this stuff is physical weathering. Now, chemical weathering, on the other hand, is not where we have stuff just physically being broken apart, but we have some kind of chemical reaction occurring, some kind of alteration. The rock is decomposing, or it's, you know, it's decaying in some way. Stuff is dissolving. There are things that are actually changing in the rock. So it's getting smaller, but not necessarily into, you know, smaller hunks of the same rock. It's chemically changing. And one clue that you're dealing with chemical weathering is that the names are pretty chemically, right? Like all that, that physical stuff, you know, like frost action. It, just, it sounds like, you know, physical, ugh. whereas chemical weathering, it sounds nerdy. Right, hydrolysis, oxidation, carbonic. It's got that the elements actually in the name, right? So there's another clue. Just as you're studying through or taking the test or whatever, you know, think about what um, what you know answers are you you faced with here, right? It's kind of obvious which one's the chemical one versus which one's the physical one when you even think about what these things mean. So we'll go through hydrolysis, oxidation. This carbonic acid dissolution, um, and just you know, again, like with the physical stuff, make sure you understand what these things are, what make them different from the other things. And these, I'm not going to dwell on the first two as much as I will on the third. 
also use that. Let's go to a study guide here. But with hydrolysis, um, this is where, like specifically, so hydro is water, right? And, and we have, there's some different examples of this stuff, but we're specifically talking about what's happening with rainwater uh, and some very low level acids and how they specifically react with granite, okay? And it's the feldspar in granite, which is one of the minerals that makes up granite. So remember, we have minerals, put a bunch of those together, you get a rock, right? So we got quartz, uh, hornblende, this different stuff in granite. But these acids in the water react specifically with feldspar, and it just, it breaks it down. There's a chemical alteration. It's not that it just, you know, smashes the feldspar. It actually causes it to dissolve, to change. And so we just get clay and salt as a, uh, um, you know, as a result of this stuff, but it's taken out of the granite. So that feldspar no longer exists, and therefore that is weathering the rock itself. And the resulting stuff, it's not little bits of feldspar, it's clay, just kind of, you know, left behind. And then what's cool about this, in the sense of hydrolysis and granite, is that it often leads to spheroidal weathering, which is referring to you know, this spheroidal shape, the rounded shape of some of this stuff. So as the acidic water gets into some of the joints that are in granite, you know, maybe the joints that came from that pressure release stuff, maybe it's from something else. But as it gets into the different cracks in the rock, it just, it leads to, it dissolves in such a way. And again, it's this, this physics like surface area kind of thing that causes this stuff to get rounded. Right? Almost like it's getting polished or, or whatever. But it's simply that feldspar disappearing because of this chemical weather. Yeah, that's what's at work. Here's another one of those old Yosemite pictures. And you kind of see with this, um, all of the exfoliation stuff I showed you, it just it looks like broken rock. right? Whereas this, this does look dissolved. right? Like something is happening chemically where it's getting worn down. It's not just getting broken, but it's actually getting worn down, right? That's that hydrolysis uh, with the spherical weathering as well, okay? As the stuff disintegrates and, and disappears. Okay, the second type is oxidation. Uh, you know, it's rusting. It's the, the red that we see in different rocks. It's oxygen and water reacting with stuff like iron that's in the rock, right? And so it causes, as it does this, causes it to disintegrate, so we have this chemical weather. But honestly, oxidation, it's rusting. Um, there's not that much exciting stuff you can say about it, especially, like the reason I just get through this one uh, is because I know I got melting saint faces uh, coming up next, right? Carbonic acid dissolution. Yeah, look at that. This is in a, a cathedral uh, in France where these saints here were outside of the cathedral for a while, uh, and until uh, their faces started to melt off, and that's you know Catholics, uh, not a big fan of melting saint uh, faces. You've seen The Exorcist. Um, this scary stuff, right? And it wasn't actually the devil. Um, no, it was you know another type of acid in rainwater. This is carbonic acid, so something different. And we're not dealing with granite either in this case. So it's different from the hydrolysis of which we just spoke. Um, but no, we're talking about carbonic acid dissolving, you know, destroying, chemically changing these carbonate rocks, specifically limestone is what we're getting into, or, you know, by default, marble, which used to be limestone. So it's where carbon dioxide dissolves into water up in the atmosphere, okay? And we've got, you know, CO2 up in the atmosphere, we spend a lot of time talking about that. Some of it just naturally occurring, some of it our fault. But when the CO2 dissolves into water, it produces this very weak carbonic acid. And it's the idea, and again, we're talking natural in what we're discussing uh, here. But it's the kind of deal, if there's some carbonic acid in rainwater and it falls on you, your skin's not going to melt off or whatever. Like, it's not terrifying, but it is. It has just this rainwater has a lower pH than other rainwater without it, right? So technically it's acidic, but what happens is the, the 
carbonic acid, this dissolved CO2, it reacts with the stuff that's in limestone and these other what we call carbonate rocks. Uh, and so with that, we have, and again, a chemical reaction taking place and it leads to this dissolving. And it's just what's amazing about it is the scale at which it can operate. All right, this is a picture from Boston. And Boston, I love. It's a fantastic city in just that you get stuff like this. Like we're walking around downtown, big urban area, having a great time. And then suddenly there's a spooky, most likely zombie filled cemetery just in the middle of town, right? Because the, you know, the city's like 400 years old or whatever. And so people died 400 years ago and they buried them here and the city just kept growing. And so you have this stuff. And I just love like everything's kind of off to the side kind of a I mean it's just thank goodness it was it was light outside so the zombies couldn't get us um but when you go through here because it's open like you're, like you're not going to walk through here come on it's fantastic um but when you walk through here you see that some of the uh gravestones uh you you know you can still read the the words and the carving uh, in like this does it say 1797 I think right there um so that's still there still very clear from, you know, centuries ago. And then you get this stuff where you can't see anything, right? That's that carbonic dissolution at work. Okay, an example of two things next to each other. This one clearly inscribed, like you clear that, you know, moss, lichen, whatever it is out of there. You can still read it clearly. Other stuff, it's dissolved, right? So that's, you know, that's an example of this. And also just, you know, a bit of, you know, if you're shopping around, um, you know, don't, don't go for the marble one. Don't go, uh, you know, go for slate or whatever. Get a hold up over the years, right? I don't know if any, we probably don't do like limestone uh, uh, headstones for this very reason today. All right, so that's kind of just a cool, you know, spooky thing. But what's even better than the spookiness um, is what we call karst. Okay? And karst is where we have a lot of, of chemically weathered limestone over a large area. And the name itself, it's not like one of these Greek or Latin things where it's easy to figure out what's going on. I want to say it's named for like a place in Hungary, named like Karst or whatever, where this was first studied. So it's kind of a weird name compared to this other stuff, this other weird name. Um, but it, it's simply referring to a lot of limestone um, where it has just just super cool stuff. Sinkholes and caverns and these big, you know, tower, um, you know, hill kind of things. And so and like, there's just super cool stuff. It's fantastic. And again, it's limestone. Talked about that. Limestone exists where stuff used to be underwater, right? Because it's all, it's the little hard parts of, you know, seashells and stuff like that that dissolve. Water goes away. That chemically precipitated sedimentary rock stuff takes place. And so we get limestone. Right, and so um, you know we see it all over. This map is showing, you know, basically where places used to be underwater. Um, the I think this might be the Central Valley here. Some of these, when you start to look, like kind of zoom in to a specific location, it's hard to say. But throughout California, we got tons of karst that exists because we're relatively new. I think I mentioned that before. Like, we don't really have dinosaur fossils here because we didn't have dinosaurs uh, because we were all underwater, right? And then slowly, as the Sierra Nevada form and the coastal range form that blocks the Central Valley away from the rest of the ocean, there's a lot of limestone up and down the state because we used to be underwater. So we've got this here. We'll also, we'll talk about Florida, uh, though, because they have much cooler uh, amounts than we do. So on the East Coast, you can see even more significant amounts of this stuff. But it is everywhere. It's a global thing. And so karst can look like this, where you just have these little, you know, undulations, the, the different little, you know, dips in here and hills and stuff like that. And you might think, based on what we talked about, that we get this through folding and compressional forces and all that. No. This is actually, as this water falls down, it just starts dissolving these little pits around here. You can see this pond, that water is going to be, you know, slightly acidic, just enough 
you continue to dissolve limestone, and so we have these little dips everywhere. So that's a, a massively chemically weathered landscape that we're looking at. So that's how that works. Now sinkholes are where as stuff starts to get weathered and dissolved and this water keeps getting deeper into the earth, eventually that stuff can get underneath existing land, you know, open up different caves and cavern networks and, and all of that uh, until this you know there's this big void underneath an area and the stuff that's still there nothing's holding it up right it can't continue to be there so it drops in and that's what we call a sinkhole and this one is in belize yeah i stole this from an old book um it's cool to look at um just to think of that happen but it's also not terrifying in that it's in the middle of the jungle um maybe you know a monkey got scared or whatever but this isn't like you know keep you in terror or whatever but there are some sinkholes that are oh uh, you know it's god oh it's terrifying terrifying this in uh, case in point this is in florida all right and so years ago now this is back in 2013 a guy is uh just in his house sleeping uh everything's fine probably had a great day uh goes to bed uh and then gets sucked uh into a giant pit uh, to hell, um, and, and, uh, you know, died, um, in that, and it, I'm just, and I say this, you know, as, as a matter of fact, like this, because it is the most terrifying concept in the world, right, like, if we can't talk about this, like, it's, it's not absurd, uh, we'll just all start crying, and we've got, like, we don't have enough to worry about right now, right, um, no, this is a terrifying, terrifying thing, and it was a case where I heard about this, I, you know, I'm sure I was like driving to work and heard it on the radio or, or something. And so as soon as I hear this, you know, sinkhole and grotesque, horrifying death, I think, oh, my God, I got to share this with my students. You know, they, like I'm going to be, you know, an educator, but really I just want to freak you guys out. Uh, and so I go to the Internet to try to find pictures. And I'm assuming it's going to be this house that's just in pieces and terrifying. And this is what I get. Which actually, I think is actually more scary. If you didn't have all these emergency workers here and the yellow tape and all of that, if you just saw this, you wouldn't necessarily think there was anything spectacular going on, right? Like, this doesn't look like there's a pit to hell anywhere around here. No, it's in the master bedroom of this house, but it doesn't extend outward to the rest of the property. Yeah, it's even spookier, uh, I think. That, you know, just lying in wait to just grab this guy and take him down. And so what happened was, it's crazy, um, you know, in this part of Florida, all throughout Florida, sinkholes are a concern, right? Because they happen. And part of, like, if you own a home and you're going to get insurance and all that, you have to have geologists come out to check the area and decide whether or not you are susceptible to these sinkholes and, uh, and that's what happened in this area. Like a month before this, a guy came out and said, no, you look good. I think you're going to be fine. Sleep well. Um, guy got his insurance. Everything was cool. And then, yeah, like a month later, pit to hell. All right? And we could easily say, like, oh, that's stupid geologist. But honestly, if you look at this, if there aren't any, you know, there's no evidence of sinkholes away from the house there. And the only sinkhole opened up right underneath the house. There's only so much any of us can do, right? When we build something on top uh, of the land, we can't really easily see what's going on underneath there. Maybe it had something to do with a leaking pipe or something like that, or just, you know, water was getting underneath the house and it just opened up, but there was no visible stuff. Who knows? I mean, the guy could have been a you know, awful geologist as well, but it, you can see how somebody wouldn't necessarily catch this when it happened in such a specific way location and it turns out i think we got the picture here yeah um they never got the guy like the, they never recovered the body because he just he fell in um and it was so dangerous they couldn't get him and and pull him out right isn't that, i mean that's just amazing and you look at this picture this guy looks ridiculous right he's like one of the toddlers um that you know you see the parents have the the leash on him like when you're walking through the mall or whatever that's the look he's got. It looks stupid until you realize, like, no, this is in case another pit to hell opens up. This is so they can pull him out, right? 
But the original guy, the guy who lived in the house, the guy who died, um, gone. Like they just could not recover him because it was too dangerous. And I think they've since they like they bulldozed everything, and I'm not entirely sure what goes on. But that is terrifying, right? And uh, in a few weeks after this incident happened, there was a guy on a golf course not too far away from here, and he was just like, you know teeing up, getting ready to uh, to whack the ball, and the pit tail. And he fell into that. And they were able to get this guy out, at least, like the hole wasn't as deep. But still, Florida, it's crazy. Don't ever live there. I mean, it's like if, you you know, if the hurricanes don't get you, or the Klan uh, doesn't get you, or whatever, it, it's, it, you're going to pit tail. Pit to hell. Terrifying. Except, wait a second. I was just saying, like, we got one of those down here. We're out California. Do we have to worry about single? Do we? Do we have a pit to hell tonight? In our homes? In our beds? Are you guys safe? What do you guys think? I don't know. I've been talking for a while. I'm kind of tired. I'm sure you're fine. You'll be fine. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, I'll come back. I'll let you guys know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, geographers. I won't leave you hanging uh, on this stuff. Good news. We're most like, like, well, let me put it this way. I'm trying to say it. I cannot say, you can never say never when it comes to the earth. There's always a chance of a pit to hell opening up at any given time. Um, so, I mean, there's that. But I do have to be very clear. I did send one guy into panic attacks. One student I had, he was freaking out. But then he potholed he saw on like his way home um, from class. So I'm, I'm making sure I'm very clear with this. In California. On the list of ways in which the earth could kill you, sinkhole under your bed, way down at the bottom. Way, way down there. Uh, and that's that's great, although the, one of the reasons is why it's also connected to the fact that we're probably going to die of thirst before we even have to worry about a sinkhole. Uh, let me explain. See, the reason why Florida has this stuff is because it's a bunch of limestone, you know, the peninsula itself. So there's a lot of that, number one. But they also have a lot more rain coming into the area. So there's just more, the erosion is taking, or the weathering, I should say, is taking place at a much more rapid rate. But it's also, because of all of the open caverns and holes and all of that underneath the state, they have a big aquifer underneath there. And so new rainwater comes in, it gets stored underneath the ground, and then Floridians can just, you know, tap down into that, drill wells, pull that water up. Fantastic. But more and more people move to Florida. I don't know why, right? Sinkholes and clan and alligators and hurricanes and all that stuff. But still, more and more people go there. There are thirsty people. Because, you know, it's hot. So they keep bringing up that water. And that causes the water table. We talked about this a long time ago. Um, we we're talking about groundwater. But the water table drops and so what that does is it leaves this void there's no water helping to hold up the ground and so it's just this big empty space underneath the surface and that's what causes a sinkhole right here in california we have aquifers and we have limestone and all of that but honestly we have destroyed our aquifer so much and we get so little rain coming in anyway that the state itself, we don't have like little individual sinkholes that happen. Instead, like a big chunk of the state has just kind of collectively dropped in unison, right? So we've sunk down and the ground has kind of gotten compacted. Um, so it's very hard for us to recharge our aquifers and all that. So like we've got our own issues there. But the good news is that the likelihood of one of these sinkholes happening here way less because we just don't have these big open spaces uh or protective aquifers underneath the state right so we got that going for us we you know there's a win in our column uh, yeah but you know you'll we got fire and uh corona and we got the clan here oh my god all right so yeah what all right but the good news sinkholes not a big deal you follow all right now, sinkholes um, are, you know, fantastic um, in just their spookiness. But the really great thing about cars are the cavern networks that open up. And, and it's the idea, like a cave is just an individual, 
you know, compartment or whatever underneath the ground. A cavern is a connected network of these caves. Uh, and so these caverns that exist are the result of water coming down into this limestone bedrock stuff that's right here. All right, it goes down uh, into the limestone. It causes it to uh, dissolve and disappear, and that opens up channels and more stuff goes in, and it just keeps opening up these massive cavern systems. And they are fantastic. I mean, to just go and explore. It's, it's amazing. If you haven't ever done this, this is, you know, one such thing with some people for scale here. This is all carbonate limestone material that we're dealing with, and it's all just been dissolved by rainwater to the point where you can go in. Right, And the act of going into a cave, exploring a cave, is called spelunking. I don't know why. It's ridiculous. But look, you got to do it. It is phenomenal. When, you know, society gets back to normal, first thing you got to do, well, I mean, go ahead. Go, go to a movie. Go to the mall. Whatever. Um, but uh, go, go spelunking. Find a cavern and go explore it. It is amazing in how otherworldly... It is. Um, over the last summer, I finally got to go to Carlsbad Caverns National Park uh, down in New Mexico. It's my youngest boy, Max, right there, posing awesomely uh, for the camera, you know, just for scale. We'll see him again later. But my whole family, we got to go. And it's Carlsbad. I know just from experience, like a few students every now and then will have gone there, but many haven't. It's far from Southern California, it's in you know, New Mexico. Um, it's also, it's not the most convenient thing. Like it's right next, it's not right next to Albuquerque or someplace you might, you know, want to go to. It's it's not even in Carlsbad. It's like 30 miles away from that. Um, we stayed in the weirdest little like trailer park thing to get there. It was charming. Um, but the, the national park itself, phenomenal, right? And I haven't yet, looked at how the National Park Service screwed, you know, indigenous people who've lived here. I kind of don't want to do it because I really liked it. But honestly, people, you got to go here. It is an amazing thing. And when you drive up, you just see this building and it's kind of like, okay. I mean, there are a bunch of tarantulas crossing the road and some cool, you know, desert uh, life as you're driving up toward it. Um, but what happens is you see this building and then you go over to, like, you know, I said pit to hell earlier talking about a sinkhole, but this seriously, I mean, this just looks like spookiness uh, abounds, right? And the night before we went in, there were bats flying out of it, and we got saw this ranger talk. It was fantastic. Here's Max for scale peering into the abyss uh, right here. But you just go, you know, back and forth, and the temperature drops rapidly as you go down in here, and you're walking in through this kind of stuff, and it's lit enough so you can see but it's way darker than this image makes it look i tried to take some pictures and brighten some of this stuff so you could actually see the different columns and stalactites and stalagmites and all that and really it's the the uh stalactites are coming from the ceiling itself so from up top so they hang things hanging down and stalagmites are the ones that are coming up from the floor but it's the idea that this water as it's dripping through you know and dissolving stuff and all that it, it, it's dissolving right so it's carrying minerals and, and stuff with it uh, as it's moving through and then those minerals can get precipitated as it's continuing to fall from the ceiling or land on the floor here and that's what all these different things are and columns exist when the stalactite and the stalagmite actually meet Right, so the thing fuses together like we're seeing right here. But it was fantastic. And you just you hike for miles into this thing and go through and explore. And my other kids for you know more scales, you're cruising through here. It looks way darker than these pictures, you know, make it look. Um, but just really remarkable stuff. Remarkable stuff. And you know what's really crazy? There's a gift shop down at the bottom, which normally I would say, that's awful, right? But it was all just the just the craziness of it. 
kind of made it fun. <laughs> you can go like we got sandwiches. Um, down at the bottom of a cave. It's phenomenal. And it's all based on this whole karst idea of carbonic uh, dissolution. Right, that acid dissolving limestone and limestone like materials and opening up some really, really remarkable stuff. All right, so that's what we're dealing with here. Does that make sense? Yeah, hopefully it makes sense. Um, all right, that's it for today. Next time, I think I'm going to talk alien stuff next time, which will be, you know, winds, but I'm also going to talk fluvial stuff and connect all that in deserts and we'll talk about the Mojave specifically and we'll we'll get a sense of because we don't have caverns quite like this around the Mojave Desert. We do have some little ones here and there. Um but we'll get into why this place looks the way it does. Alright? Alright, so start reading this stuff, studying this stuff, start planning to get out uh to New Mexico when you can, because it really is fantastic. And until then, uh have a lovely uh, have a lovely time just hanging out in your house, geographers. Until next time.